we live in an age which is often called a psychedelic renaissance and uh, there is a big hype around uh, psychedelics. What do you think, what, what will be the long lasting heritage of, of this era? We're in a really interesting phase of psychedelic research and study at present. Some people call it the psychedelic renaissance. Of course, the original uh, episode was in the 50s and 60s. It had huge impact in many areas, but some people didn't like the fact it was changing art and music and politics. So these drugs got banned. And, and actually that ban has lasted for over 50 years, almost everywhere in the world. To my mind, it's the worst censorship of research of science there has ever been. But at last, we have a renaissance, it's coming back. And why is it coming back? And it's coming back for, for two real re main reasons. It's coming back because we know the science, we know the pharmacology of these drugs, we know the brain science of these drugs. Uh, and we also know that th the brain science helps make sense of why they work. So we can go from molecule, receptor, brain imaging, patients, it all makes sense. So that's the first reason. There's a scientific underpinning. The second reason is that psychiatry is failing. We haven't had a, any innovation in psychiatric treatment for core mental illness for decades. Uh, and so patients are suffering and then the rates of depression are going up and the rates of number of people with resistant depression are going up. And psychedelics seem to have the ability to do something that other treatments don't do. They change the way people think about their disorder. They can break people out of routines of thinking that are destructive and persistent. And that's why they have such a broad utility. You can use them for depression, use them for anxiety, use them for addiction. <clears throat> We're doing trials now in, in anorexia and OCD, or disorders in which people get locked into thinking uh, processes, thinking loops that they don't want to be in, but they can't escape from. So this particular peculiar ability of psychedelics to kind of refresh thinking processes, it means that you know, it can be very effective when other treatments have failed. Psychedelics can be used as medicines in a specific context together with psychotherapy in a specific setting. So can the pharmaceutical industry use them as, as modern medicines? Because one of the interesting things about this renaissance is it being driven largely by researchers uh, not by the pharma industry. Uh, and that has, a, has benefits and it has drawbacks. The obvious drawback is trying to get money to do the big trials because we've got so conditioned to believing that you need a trial of 300 people to show a drug effect that when you do a small trial with 30 people in each group, people say it's too small, even though the effect sizes are enormous. You only need these 300 people in traditional trials because the effect sizes are so small. But, but that is, we've, to, we've got to break the mold about how you think about research in that sense. But the other thing is, I think that the pharma industry doesn't quite know how it could use these drugs because for most people, the real benefit of a psychedelic drug is going to be when you use it to change people's minds, but also let them engage then with psychotherapy to maintain and persist this improvement. Now that means you've got psychotherapy and pharmacology together and there's really never been a, a, a medicine for the mind licensed that does these two things simultaneously. So no one knows how to do it, the regulators don't know what to do and the drug companies of course, are, you know, they don't know what to do. So, so it may be, it's going to have to be us as a community that does it because it may be that companies won't ever really manage to to do that. I mean, hopefully they will, because I think that the more research we get done, and if we could get good research done by, by companies, that would be helpful. But I suspect if we don't, we will still pursue this in a different way. There are some researchers who try to separate the hallucin hallucinogenic effects of psychedelics from their medical benefits. What do you think about this direction of research? This is a very new field and we're finding that it's, it's going off in different directions. So one of the most remarkable discoveries in the last few years is this ability of psychedelic drugs to produce a, a phenomenon called neuroplasticity, to help synapses grow, to help synapses form, to lay, help the brain lay down new ways of, of behaving or thinking, etc. And that's called neuroplasticity. Now, it, it turns out that 
you can promote neuroplasticity through the same receptor as you produce a psychedelic effect. But in some cases, with molecules that don't seem to be psychedelic, at least in a rodent. Now, there's a long way between a rodent brain and a human brain. So the first thing to say is it may turn out that these non-psychedelic plastogens actually are psychedelic in humans. That's a possibility. But if they're not, that does raise an interesting question. Could they be useful? Now, there are two things to say about this. The first is the drive to do this is complicated. It's partly the drive is to get around the regulations. If it's psychedelic, it's a controlled drug. If it's not a psychedelic, it won't be a controlled drug. So it, it, it's a commercial opportunity. But on top of that, you've also got this uh, amazing investment by the US Armed Forces because they would like their servicemen who've been traumatized in war, you know, who, who currently are going to Costa Rica or Brazil to get ayahuasca, they'd like them to be given a treatment which was legal. So they're investing in these, uh, these uh, plastogens as well. But whether they really will work as well as a psychedelic, I, I personally doubt. And I think they might be useful if you give them repeatedly. They, they might be an alternative traditional antidepressant. You give them each day and you, you tickle the brain up a bit. And you, it might be a bit like microdosing. You, know, you can get in a small effect each day, which builds up to a good effect. But I'd be very surprised if a single dose of a non-psychedelic plastogen suddenly turns someone from resistant depression to being almost normal, as we can see with psychedelics. What's your review on microdosing? Well, so microdosing of psychedelics is, you know, has been going on pretty much ever since psychedelics were banned. And you know, there are great protagonists like Jim Fadiman who've, who've worked with the, uh, particularly mushrooms and low dose LSD to, to, to promote the, the, uh, the idea, to, to, again, to keep, keep it under the radar so that it, you know, it's not so obvious that you're taking them. And there's loads, you know, millions of people worldwide are microdosing. Does it work? Well, it, our recent research suggests that it, it does work if you think you're taking the drug. So if, you, if you're taking a microdose and you think you're taking a microdose, you get in benefits. But the same is true if you take placebo. If you think the placebo is a microdose, you get the same benefit. So, there is, so it's the desire to have an effect, to have benefit, that is driving the microdosing effect at present. But one of the re in things to think about is that there's not been a much research on microdosing because it's still illegal. Even a single molecule of a psychedelic is illegal. So study, microdosing has actually not been studied as much as it should be because of the illegal status of the drugs. In time, it may turn out that microdosing does have utility, but we can't say for sure yet. How do psychedelics, such as uh, psilocybin, compare to traditional antidepressants in treat treating uh, depression? So one of the obvious things about uh, psychedelics is that when you use them, you get a profound effect in the brain, on the mind, and often within hours or a day, you've kind of reset your thinking processes so that people have escaped from their obsessional thoughts about depression or addiction. So, that, so they act very quickly. Now, so that's very different from conventional antidepressants where the effect tends to build up over a period of, of four to six, eight weeks. And I think that's because they work in fundamentally different ways. The way I think tr traditional antidepressants work is to dampen down the stress response in the brain and they protect the brain in the same way as if you have a broken leg, you put your leg into plaster, plaster of Paris. Now the plaster of Paris doesn't heal the bone. What the plaster of Paris does is protect the bone so it can heal itself. So traditional antidepressants protect the brain, particularly emotional circuits of the brain, which are oversensitive in depression. They dampen those down and then let them heal over a period of weeks. Psychedelics work in a completely different way. They work on different receptors, they work in different parts of the brain, and they produce a profound perturbation of the thought loops which um, persist and drive depression. So there are fundamentally different ways of, of achieving the same goal. And that fundamental difference is very apparent, not only in terms of, for instance, side effects, where we see the dampening down of emotions uh, with um, SSRIs and antidepressants isn't just for bad emotions, it's not just, they're not anti-stress, they're also, they block people's ability to, to have pleasure. Uh, you know, they, it tends to blunt all emotions, whereas 
psilocybin or psychedelics tend to open up, make people more emotional, but less depressed. And then we can see that with the brain imaging. We can see that in the brain, people on SSRIs, they, they do have blunted responses to stressful images, whereas people with psilocybin don't. But then when we look at the other parts of the brain where psilocybin works, we can see psilocybin increases connectivity. It increases the flexibility of the brain, whereas SSRIs don't. What about ketamine? How does that compare to psilocybin? How does it affect the brain and how is it used to treat depression? So ketamine is a very interesting drug because in many ways ketamine came along at the beginning of the psychedelic renaissance and it, it's interesting to think um, how it compares with psychedelics so, because ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. It's been used for many years as a, as a very safe anesthetic because it doesn't suppress respiration. So there's loads of, you know, lots of experience in some countries in Africa. It's the dominant anesthetic. You don't need a doctor to give it but it does produce this strange brain state. And uh, that state is not dissimilar to the psychedelic state. In fact, when we do our brain imaging studies, uh, losing um, electroencephalography, we see you cannot tell the difference between ketamine, a brain under ketamine, brain under psilocybin, brain under esteem. People can tell the difference. They are out of their heads in different ways, but they, are, they can tell the difference. But ketamine works on a different receptor system. So psychedelics work on a serotonin receptor called the 5-HC2A receptor. Ketamine works on glutamate receptors. Uh, so somehow those seem to produce the same effect in terms of the brain circuits. But you can, you can distinguish the effects of ketamine because ketamine's effects on depression are, tend to be shorter lasting. They don't, you know, they come on, they're there a day, they may walk, disappear over two or three days. So the current therapy for depression with ketamine derivatives like S-ketamine is they say twice a week for a few weeks to try to build up the um, benefit. Whereas with psilocybin, you get a big effect with one dose. And we don't understand why that is. It might just be you, psilocybin gives you more oomph, grows more of those synaptic spines, but ketamine grows spines as well. So it might be something else going on. So, so one other possibility is that ketamine sort of sows the seeds of its own problems because not only does it it is a sort of psychedelic, but it, but it also can block some memories. And, and that might be that it, it sort of gets in the way of the therapeutic process of it, that it's generated through its psychedelic effects. So, but ketamine is still a very useful tool. So for instance, in the UK, I can only use psychedelic, psilocybin particularly, for research. So if I want to treat patients, I have to use ketamine. And uh, you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, of clinical work now using ketamine to treat depression and to treat uh, addictions because that's all we got our hands on at present. There are psychedelics such as ayahuasca and ibogaine that are used, uh, has been used uh, for thousands of years in a traditional cultural context. Can we take out these uh, substances and use them as modern medicines? I mean, one of the things we have to be very conscious of uh, is that Western science didn't discover psychedelics. We discovered how they worked, but we didn't discover. They've been around in cultures for, for probably for tens of thousands of years. And they've had very important roles. Look at the role of ayahuasca in, in Latin American, South American culture. You know, look at the role of mushrooms in, in Mexican culture. You know, potentially the role of psychedelics in the origins of Hinduism, Amanita Mascaras in Siberian culture, etc. So they've had a long cultural use. And we must make sure that Western science, by understanding the pharmacology, doesn't then ignore the other lessons. And, and, and it, there are two things we must do. We must definitely make sure that the, those people who've been working with these for, for centuries are not disadvantaged. We don't steal their, 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 their knowledge without, and we, you know, it, there should be an equitable reimbursement of anything. We, and we, fact, we should work together to try to learn from their, their processes as well as what the drugs they use. We should also be learning how to optimally use them. You know, when you've got a few thousand years worth of experience, it, there's probably some things in there that we aren't going to guess ourselves. So I think you know, a really deep dialogue about how, how best to use them, whether it's in group therapy or singly, or what age people should perhaps be exposed. There's a lot we can learn from, from indigenous peoples who have, were there with these, um, these compounds a long time before us. How do you see the future of psychedelics? How will they find their place and what role they will play in mainstream mental health care? 
So where we are at present with psychedelics is we are on a crest of an amazing wave of research and understanding. And my own view, but it's also my hope, is that this is the next great revolution in psychiatric medicine and also neurological medicine. I mean, we haven't talked about the fact that, you know, psychedelics can help in disorders like headaches, some kinds of headache. We're also trying to develop um, psychedelics for stroke. There's the, 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 the regrowth of neurons might be helpful in stroke. So they may have a very broad utility. And I think if we take the field forward responsibly and we, we use them at least initially in medicine in a, in a very sensible and a way where we collect the data very efficiently, I think they will be medicines. I think within, within five years, there will be psychedelic medicines in, in a number of countries. Not all countries, because some countries are still obsessed with the war on drugs kind of ideology, but they, I'm sure they will be available. And those countries that have them will see benefits. There is a lot of resistance and skepticism among uh, the general public and the scientific community about psychedelics. How can we overcome that? What are your uh, uh, recommendations on, on the best communication? Well, I think uh, the public are probably somewhat more in tune with what's going on in the psychedelic space than, uh, than many scientists. I've, I find it quite worrying you know, I talk to eminent professors of psychopharmacology, worked in the field for 20, 30 years, who do not understand that psychedelics are not the dangerous drugs that they have been told they are. People have accepted at face value the idea that they're very dangerous, addictive, and therefore schedule one drugs. When in fact, when I point out to them, they're not very dangerous and they're not addictive at all, in fact they're anti-addictive, they don't want to believe it. And I think part of the problem is that, is that scientists are supposed to know evidence. And, and when you confront them with knowledge that shows that they're completely wrong, they get a bit defensive. So I, the education process, I think, has got to come through patients. So we've got to have patients who've benefited telling the world about their, but giving them their narratives of how they've benefited. We've got to have scientists, you know, like the people here at this conference, who are showing that there's a good, solid science to psychedelics. In fact, we probably understand more about how psychedelics work in depression than we understand how antidepressants work in depression now. So that, we've got to push the science, push the, 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 the make, make scientists and politicians aware of the great need and the great value. And then hopefully it'll flip. I mean, I'm not finding scientists now stand up and criticize me like they used to 10 years ago, but that doesn't mean they're on the side. They might just have learned to shut up. So we still got a way to go.